Hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk coming to you from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC. We're also streaming live on the iTunes and on the iHeart apps. And later on, you can actually find us archived on Spreaker.com right here on this great station's uh, platform. So hi there, my name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This, of course, depends on when you are listening and watching. So we say hello to everybody listening to WHBC. But also, I'm waving to the right, to the left, to the center, because you can see us right here in the studio. Just go to the Facebook.com WHBC or my own page at Facebook.com Anshul Pearl. Make a comment. Let us know where you're listening. Let us know. So hello on the radio. Hello online and hello to the world. Let's start with food. Hey, what else is Jewish? You know, it's all about food. This coming week, of course, this coming Wednesday evening, all day Thursday and all day Friday, we begin the Jewish New Year 5785. And uh, food is an important part. And I'd like to first discuss, interestingly, the challahs, the particular bread that's eaten on these high holidays is different than the Sabbath, Sabbath uh, challahs. All year round, our challah is usually braided. But for Rosh Hashanah, it is round. Go into the store now and ask for a challah, and you will find Jean Bradenston right there. She bought out all the challahs available in all the stores. So go early to make sure you find your challahs. Let's discuss why. Why does the challah shape? What does it teach us about this special time of the year? Why is it that the challah is made in a round as opposed to a braided one. You see, Rosh Hashanah is a holiday filled with physical doorways into the spiritual world. And the blast of the shofar are a primary example of this. But there are many others as well. For example, all year round, we dip our challah in salt before distributing it to the guests and to the family. However, during the high holiday season, so many uh, use honey so that we all have a sweet year. For the same reason, many choose to make a sweeter challah dough as well. We also begin the evening Rosh Hashanah meals by dipping apples in honey and reciting a prayer for a good and sweet year. And by the way, when you cut your apples to dip it into honey, make sure you cut it across. Uh, we would say we call it diagonally across as opposed to vertically. Because when you cut it across horizontally, you will cut the apple typically in half and you will actually expose that around the star inside the, the apple, there are 10 green dots. Every apple that way. If you buy an apple that is missing those green dots, I suggest you take it back to the store. Um, but around, what's the significance? So the, in Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism explains that these green dots, rep, which are 10 of them, represent the 10 commandments. And we dip the apple in the honey that our year should be sweetened with goodness, with kindness, with acts of goodness and kindness, and the applications of doing many good deeds and many mitzvahs. So we begin the evening of Rosh Hashanah, dipping the apple in honey, and we make a prayer for a good, sweet year. By the way, the idea of Happy New Year is really not the typical Jewish expression this time of the year. It's somewhat adapted from, uh, from society. The typical year, Shana Tovo Masukah, a good and sweet year. Now, many, many uh, customs are around. People have all kinds of symbolic fruits, reciting prayers that contain an allusion to the food's Hebrew name. For example, there is uh, Marin. Marin is a Yiddish for, um, for people have uh, carrots, carrot uh, on the night of, of, uh, of Rosh Hashanah. In Yiddish, the word carrots is merin, and merin means to increase, that we look forward to a year when we all have um, increased good health, and happiness, and success. As we say uh, to Richard D. Ruttenberg, what's cooking? Well, let me tell you, every Jewish custom is significant on a deeper level. Some have levels that we cannot access, while others are beyond our grasp. But even the shape of a loaf of challah can teach us something deep about the holiday in which it is 
consumed. And we're discussing, dear friends, why is it that if you go to the stores, to the bakeries, the challah that is sold for this time of year, Rosh Hashanah, is a round one as opposed to the um, braided one. Well, let's let's get right into it. I mean, put it, I'm putting on my, uh, you know, baking, my baking, uh, you know, and I'm getting ready to say good morning to Rosemary Hoffman. So nice to hear from you, Rosemary. Thank you so much. The Shabbat challah is braided. What do we say? We say six days you shall work and, gr- and engage in creative activities, and on the seventh you shall desist. So part of the preparation for the Sabbath is engaging in creative activities, and braiding is such an activity. This is because the braid is a shape that does not appear in nature. Uh, there's a certain tree that's hand braided. It is a shape in order to make a braid, it's made by humans, and it represents the human ability to manipulate the raw material of the world. Braiding the khala strands helps us to harness our creative capacities for the purpose of observing the Sabbath. However, braiding represents even more than that. The Talmud tells us that God himself braided Eve's hair in preparation for her wedding to Adam. Chava. Those who don't understand what Eve is, Eve in Hebrew is Chava. What what, what does this mean? That God was braiding Chava's, Eve's hair for the wedding, the wedding to Adam. Was he merely beautifying her? So I saw a very beautiful insight from Rabbi Avram Chaim Foyer, who teaches that God's braiding of Eve's hair was his wedding gift to the couple. He was arranging her creative energies and channeling her imagination into an ordered form that would allow her to maximize her potential as a wife. He was both charging and gifting her with the clarity, the ability, and the task to channel the couple's energy into positive directions. The braid still represents that directive to focus and give order to the energies of one's household. Furthermore, many loaves are traditionally braided out of six strands, and the six represents the days of the week that are not Shabbat. I remember that uh, my mother-in-law taught that braiding six strands into one loaf represents the six days of the week that are bound up in one Shabbat, as we say hello to Abna Zarabi. It symbolizes six directed towards one with weekdays manifesting on Shabbat. And this world bearing fruit for the next. As we say good morning, all the way down to Jupiter, Florida, to our good friend, Mark Pintel. So, again, we're discussing why on the high holiday, especially Rosh Hashanah, the chalas are typically and round as opposed to all year round where we have braided chalas. The six-stranded braid offers us the direction of channeling that enjoins us to accomplish. So now, this is all year round. While we have braided chalas, round chalas are for the high holiday season. Some say they represent a crown. A round, right? Reflecting our coronation of God as the king of the world. Others suggest that the circular shape points to the circular nature of the year. What's the Hebrew word for year? Shana, which comes from the Hebrew word for repeat. Perhaps the circle illustrates that the years just go round and round. But if you look closer, Rosh Hashanah, Chalas are not really circles, they are spirals. There are 70 faces in Torah, or in Hebrew, Shivim Ponim LaTorah. This means that there are 70 ways to understand every facet of Torah. The word panim can be translated either as face or innerness. Therefore, the Torah represents 70 different faces appearing differently depending on the psychological, intellectual, or spiritual angle from which it is examined. It also means there are 70 different inner realities for every facet that we see. King David, for example, lived for 70 years. And in our tradition, 
that is considered to be the average lifespan. Each subsequent year of life makes a person into a different creation than the year before. So if one lives the average lifetime, another understanding of the 70 faces of a Torah could mean that we, through living 70 years, have our own 70 faces that we can turn to in the Torah. Ah, this is why we often have the aha moments. Even as we study the same concepts we studied last year. Turning a different one of our faces to the Torah means that our receptor sites are different. <coughs> and we are able to tune into a new aspect each year. Good morning to Judy Kirk, who reminds us today is the last Sunday of this year, 5784. The word Shana has a double meaning as well. In addition to the word repeat, we say Shana Tova, to repeat, it also means change, Shinui. As the years go round and round, repeating the same seasons and holidays as the year before, we are presented with a choice. Do we want this Shana, this year, to be yet another repetition? Same old, same old. Or do we want Shinui? Do we want to make a change? Hopefully, each year we make choices for a change that is positive. And each year we climb higher and higher, creating a spiritual spiral. So the shape of the Rosh Hashanah Chala reminds us that this is the time of the year to make those decisions. This is the time to engage in the creative spiritual process that can lift us out of our repetitive cycle and direct our energies towards a higher end. Let us all have a very happy, sweet new year. One of the things that are important this time of the year, and particularly this rather difficult year in the Jewish world following October the 7th, is the importance of being part of a community. And I'd like to share a few moments here of the significance and of encouraging everyone to make, make the effort of joining a synagogue, your temple. If you do not have one to go to, our synagogue is open. We're at 516-739-3636. Just give us a call. We'll give you the schedule. Nobody stops you at the door. Of course, there's security and there's no tickets and uh, everyone is welcome to come. But there's, there's something more than just coming together to pray is to be part of a community. And that's what I want to share with you, the significance of being part of a community. First, a little story as I welcome now Lavana Cohen Lichter, also known as Blanche. A Jewish man passes through Texas for a few days. He stays on for business. He checks out the rooming house in this very frontier town. Not to be conspicuous, he dresses himself in Western attire and went into the only saloon in town. He was surrounded by men in cowboy clothes, wearing six shooters and looking very gruff. He ordered a beer. While sipping his beer and trying to be as inconspicuous as possible, the biggest, burliest, scroungiest looking specimen walks in and proclaims, Ah, I hear there's a Jew in here. The Jewish man cringes, says nothing. I know you're in here and you'd better speak up, says the Western man. The Jewish man knows that sooner or later he would have to face, face up to him and, ex to, and accepts the consequences of being Jewish, especially in such a remote place as this. He stands up proudly and says, I am a Jew! And the Westerner stares at him angrily. What are you hiding for? Come with me. I'll need you for a minion. So, the opening verse of the Torah portion that we read yesterday underscores the power of community in Judaism. As we say good morning to Davida Zelikson. What do we read? You're all standing this day before the Lord your God, the leaders of the tribes, your elders, your officers, every one of us, from young children to women and to the convert, goes on, lists the woodcutters and the water drawers. Okay. So, look at this. We're talking about the covenant, and the covenant emph uh, emphasizes that we need everybody, an entire community. And that's the question this morning. 
Why does Judaism place such an emphasis on community? What is so essential about interacting with other people in a social and religious framework? Why is it so important to go to shul for the high holidays or for a Sabbath? Indeed, Judaism seems obsessed with the community building. From the ritualistic obligation of praying three times daily with nine other Jews to the, tr uh, to the tremendous stature at the shul and the yeshiva joys in Jewish thought. Why? Everywhere you turn in Jewish law, there are imperatives to belong to and identify with the community. As Maimonides declares clearly of the importance of not separating yourself from the community. Now, this is a stark contrast to other religions. Almost all other religious systems, from the Christian monk to the Buddhist hermit to the Islamic imam, see the individual as the potential perfect in and of him or herself. Meaning, the truly spiritual enlightened individual can live in isolation. Indeed, is actually encouraged to live in isolation in order to attain spiritual perfection. Yet from a Jewish perspective, the individual is forced to belong to a collective in order to attain this per religious perfection. Why is that? What is the value of a community? To understand this, we must restructure our conception of what the value of a community really is. What, is, what in fact is the superiority of a large group of people over individual? Like, what do I have to go to shul for on the high, on the high holidays or a Shabbos or every day? I could do the same thing at home. Now, it might be several reasons. Perhaps the group, you could say, has more combined intellectual ability than the single person possesses. Maybe they have more cumulative life experience and wisdom to draw on. Perhaps they have a wider, more diverse range of skills accessible to them than any one person contains. The value of a collective is where individuals come together for a common goal or interest achieved by many, not by being alone as a single person in the home. Who, who, who read, said this? Uh, community, one philosopher wrote, is a collection of people whose defining characteristics is shared participation. Communities are ultimately geared towards some form of action, what drives the collective participation of the community is the individual vested interest of each member. Finding an intersection between members' individual vested interest is highly complex, and that means communities are uniquely difficult to uh, catalyze and to sustain. The idea is there's something, something going on that's deeper than just simply having a lot of people who have different, you know, abilities and different knowledges and different experiences. The definition of community, where each individual's life is enhanced through the resources that many bring to the table, I'd like to share is expressed of the importance of that through these, these stories, these anecdotes. I first begin with the great Hasidic master, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, who would pray for many hours every single day. His disciples, who had long concluded their own prayers, would form a circle around him to listen to the melody of his prayers and feast their eyes on the spectacle of a soul soaring in this meditative attachment to Hashem. They would stand in the circle around the Baal Shem Tov when he prayed. It was an unspoken rule amongst them that no one abandoned his post until their master had concluded his prayers. One day, a great fatigue and hunger fell on, on all the students. One by one, they slipped home for a bite and a few minutes rest, certain that their master, the Baal Shem Tov, his prayers would continue for several more hours. So they slipped away and uh, had, you know, had some breakfast, etc., and came back. But when they did come back, they found that he had finished prayer all that time while they had gone. So they asked him, Rebbe, how come you concluded your prayers so early today? And the Baal Shem Tov answered, they answered them with a parable. Once a group of people 
were journeying through a forest. Their leader, who was blessed with a keen eyesight, he spotted a beautiful bird perched atop a tree, a tall tree. Come, he said to his companions, I wish to capture this beautiful bird so that we may delight in her song and gaze upon her wondrous, you know, how beautiful she we was. But they asked him, how are you going to reach this bird? The tree is so high and ourselves, are, are, we, are, we are held captive by the ground. So he said, if you each climb onto the shoulders of your fellow, I will be able to climb onto the shoulders of the topmost man and reach for the treasure that be, be, uh, beckons us from the heights. In other words, get on top, pile yourself up, and I'll get onto the top, and I'll be able to reach it. And so they did that. Together, they formed a chain reaching from the earth towards the heavens to raise their leader to his goal. But they soon wearied, they got tired of the exercise, and went off to eat and rest. And the man, of course, who was on the top, who was out there to try to catch the bird, he came tumbling down. That's the story, my friends. There is something important about the group. When they all walked away, it actually, in a sense, uh, short-circuited the prayers of the Baal Shem Tov, the group, the community, the power of the community. Another story. They tell a story about a man who was part of a vibrant community. He would attend weekly Sabbath services for many years. Then he stopped coming. It was the winter time. The rabbi inquired as to the reason for this. And all he heard was that Jack was doing fine. He was feeling fine. He just stopped coming. The rabbi went to pay Jack a visit. He sees the guy sitting comfortably next to the fireplace, reading a book. The rabbi sits down next to him and doesn't say a word. They're both sitting there in the glow of the warm fire. The rabbi then takes the fire tongues and removes a live glowing coal from the flames and set it down gently in an isolated corner of the fireplace. While the rest of the fire blazed and crackled on, this piece of isolated coal grew paler and paler by the minute until it extinguished itself. It became cold and dead. Still not saying a word, the rabbi stood up, not a good night, to his congregant and went home. The next Shabbos, the man returned to Shul. A coal that's isolated from the collective fire, easily dies out. Jack got the message. When we are in shul, in the community, we come together for the high holidays, we learn from each other. We're, we become more passionate about who we are. We have examples of goodness and kindness around us. And there's a, you know, a wonderful feeling of, of excitement, of joy, of collective fire, so to speak, Alone is like the, the piece of coal that is separated from everywhere else and sadly loses its life. So what about, what happens if we, if we take into one person, we, we pile into one personality, an Einstein, a Descartes, a Hegel, a Hume, a Van Gogh, a Michelangelo, all great thinkers and influences of human society, let's roll them all into one. Would it still be coherent and logical to insist of the superiority of a group? Put that one person, would that st wouldn't that be bigger and more superior than a group of uneducated, boorish people over such a combination of talents and skills fused into one person? Let's give you a better example. What happened? You, took, you rolled into one. The, the Moses, the Arizal, the Baal Shem Tov. Would it make not make sense that, an, that I, an isolation that can grow far deeper than when the masses of the people who are, you know, put them together with groups of people who have a lower caliber intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. So why are we making a big deal about a community? You can have a, a bunch of, uh, you know, who knows what. Um, and then you, but you have this individual who, who has such great talents or rolled in Moses and Baal Shem Tov. Yet Judaism says, even the Malshemtov, even the Arizal, even Moses, whatever, 
needs to be part of a community. The classic proof case would be the concept of a minion. The fact that we must have 10 Jews before approaching God in prayer. Why is this? If we have nine perfect holy rollers, tzaddikim, they cannot start praying until some 13-year-old kid shows up. If we have a minion consisting of nine people, let's put them together. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Jeremiah, Rabbi Akiva, Rashi, Rambam. Guess what? We can't read from the Torah. We can't even say Kaddish. As holy, as great as all of them, there's only nine. Now, if we have a group of ten illiterate, you know, Jewish tailors, for example, we can declare Yiskadal v'yiskada Shemei Rabbah. If it was a question of holiness, what can the 13-year-old kid add to this amazing collection of intense holiness and this group of holy rollers that we just mentioned? This is profoundly irrational. A community is not just valuable and superior to the individual because of a quantitative advantage. The community is of a different quality entirely than a single person. It is of a different essence. If the whole difference between a person and a group was simply that a group contains more people, then the difference would be on the degree and not on the essence. However, in the Jewish perspective, is that when people come together to form a collective gathering, they actually are transcending themselves. To come to shul is an act of humility. To stay at home, sadly, a person has the opportunity, has no limits, you know, medical issues, etc., to stay at home, means a person thinks that they're the only thing in this world, that they're running their life. When you go part of a group, you go to the minion, you realize it's a collective effort. It takes all of us. We transcend ourselves and have reached a newly, an entirely novel existential plateau by becoming part of a community. A community in Jewish thought is not simply a mathematical construct of adding one person, then a second, and a, and a third. Rather, it is a jump into a, an entirely new construct of holiness and religious significance. The term used is called tzibur. That's the Hebrew word. Tzibur is an entirely new reality. A unit is created. An entity called community is formed. It is a transcendental, transcendental reality, not based any longer on numbers. You got those 10 people, you're in a different world. It's a whole different world. I want to say hello to uh, Richard. What's your mother's name? Richard, Richard's mother's listening to us all the way from Florida. Thank you so much for the best wishes. And to Richard's mom, uh, I don't have the name in front of me here, but we remember you very well and send our best wishes for a very happy, healthy, sweet new year. And what an amazing son you have uh, standing by you during this time. Sandra, Sandra, I got it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. So, being part of a community helps us transcend ourselves. We view community not just as many individuals, but as a completely new entity with completely new power, quality, energy, and vitality. It's not a matter of more. It is a matter of a new creation. This is why even the holiest and the wisest needs community. For it is only through his or her kinship with community that he or she can touch heights impossible to achieve on their own. So the purpose of community is not only utilitarian, but allows us to transcendental, to transcend ourselves. Therefore, even the saintliest and the wisest of people need community. Let me tell you a story that I recently said, and I want to say hello to everybody joining us on the radio if you're on the radio, I'm waving my hands. If you're on Facebook, you can actually see my hands. Unbelievable. What an accomplishment. Here's the story about a Kaddish at the airport. A rabbi from Cleveland, accompanied by eight of his students, was on his way to a wedding of a student at his yeshiva. The groom arranged a flight for the group scheduled to arrive a number of hours before the 
uh, wedding. As I say hello to Laura May and to Jeannie Marie, thank you so much for joining us. Despite their planning, fierce storms at the airport of their destination made it impossible to land. The plane was forced to detour to a distant airport in a different location. Dismayed at the turn of events, the rabbi and his students realized they would miss the wedding completely. Can you imagine? They would not even be able to recite the afternoon prayers, which required the ten men, since their party was a total of nine, just one man short. The group asked the supervisor at the airport where they could find a quiet place to pray. The supervisor directed them to a side room and quietly watched from the doorway as the group began to pray. When the, when the group completely completed ended their prayers, the airport supervisor said to them, why didn't you say Kaddish? Surprised at the question, the group explained that they were missing a tenth man. And the supervisor retorted in Yiddish, Ich bin nicht Yid? Am I not a Jew too? The clearly, this, the clearly overwhelmed man explained that he was by no means religious. He never prayed at all. But this day was a day like no other. Today is my father's yard site. The date of the anniversary of my father's passing, the supervisor said. Last night, my father appeared to me in a dream. He told me that today is his yard site and he requested that I say Kaddish in his merit. I told my father that I never pray. And even if I want to say the Kaddish, from where would I find a minion, a quorum? My father replied in the dream, I will make sure that there's a minion for you. You just be sure to recite the Kaddish. When I woke up this morning, I thought to myself, there's no way I will say Kaddish. But now, when I see my father's words come true, and nine Jews from far away came straight to me, I can't ignore my father's words. And with that, the airport supervisor recited the Kaddish, the Kaddish prayer for his deceased father. That's why it's so important. A Yartzak comes around. Come. You can't imagine what it means to say the Kaddish for one's uh, you know, parent, etc. So important. Again, we're discussing the importance of a community, being part of it, especially high holidays, to come to shul, to be part of the community, to identify with the feelings of community and the transcendent power that a community creates for each individual who comes. What's the moral of the story of our conversation for a community to come together, miracles happen. And to keep a community together, you need miracles. And when a community comes together, miracles happen. This is the power of our community. And it's not merely a bunch of great guys under one roof saying l'chaim and schmoozing or singing songs. Rather, in our togetherness, a whole new dynamic is created. A new light, a quantum leap from our lives as individuals to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Together, we have created and will continue to create miracles. With this in mind, I continue. Ruvain decides after his bar mitzvah that he would never pray again without a minion. He would always make an effort to always, each day, to go to be part of the shul. While returning home one night, at 3 a.m. from an out-of-town wedding, this story happened in Israel, Ruvain fell into bed exhausted. As soon as he had turned out the light, he realized that he hadn't prayed the evening prayers, the Marim service. So with tremendous effort, he dragged himself out of bed and started to dress. But it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Where is he going to find a minion this time of the day or the night? No problem. As anyone who lives in Jerusalem can tell you, day or night, you could always find a minion at some shtibel, at some particular synagogue in, in the uh, old city or around the area. That night, there was a miracle. Zichron Moshe, was his, where he li lived, was totally deserted. There was nobody there. Typically, we'd have minions throughout the night. Near, nobody, nada, nothing going on. So what did he do? He took out his cellular phone, not his pager, his cellular phone, 
and he dialed the number of a large taxi company. Hello, he says, can you please send five taxis to the shul in Zichron Moshe? Five. The, the man said, Adoni, my dear sir, it's three o'clock in the morning. You think I have five taxis? What do I think I am? What do you think I am? I'm a magician. I, have, I only have four. Okay, he says, send four. He dialed another number. Hello, please send five taxis to the synagogue in Zichron Moshe. Within 20 minutes, there was a procession of nine taxi cabs stretched neatly outside the shtibel, outside the synagogue. Adoni, said one of the drivers, why do you need nine taxis? There's no wedding here, no bar mitzvah, nothing. I want you all to turn on your meters and come inside with me. We are going to pray together the evening prayer, the Arvit. So suddenly they took out the dusty yarmulkes. Uh, they all took them out from the glove compartments of the taxis. Some were woken from a hibernation, you know, from that stretched back to their own bar mitzvah. It wasn't easy. Despite being obviously fluent in Hebrew, the drivers had no idea how to pray. What and when to answer. When they should say prayers aloud or when it should be silent. It took them a while. When they had finished, everyone went to the taxis and the meters in the taxi, in the cars were pushing up to now 80 shekels. You got nine taxis at 80 shekels each. The drivers turned off their meters and Reuven now, who had pulled this off, pulled out his wallet. He says, how much do I owe you? He said to the first taxi driver in the line, Adoni, what do you take, for, what do you take me for? Do you honestly believe that I would take money from a holy Jew like you, who just gave me such an opportunity. Do you know how long it is since I prayed? He moved down the line to the second driver, identical reaction, and the third, and the fourth, all the way down the line to the ninth. Not one taxi driver would take a penny. They all appreciate the opportunity to make the minion for this person. The power of community creates Miracles. All of us want miracles, good health, prosperity, peace around the world, peace in Israel, peace around Israel, peace in the countries around the world. Coming together on the high holidays offers us the opportunity from this higher level just to make a difference. I think there's a fable of, of the porcupine. I remember it was uh, the coldest night, uh, coldest winter night ever. Many animals died because of the cold. The poor little porcupines, realizing the dire situation they were in, decided to group together. This way, they cover themselves. But the quills of each, of, uh, of each, you know, because they had these, the quills sticking out, wounded their closest companions, even though they gave off heat that would save each other. After a while, they decided to distance themselves one from another, and soon they began to die alone and frozen. Even though they, they are little animals, they had to make a choice, life or death choice. Either accept the quills of the companions or disappear from the earth. Wisely, they decided to go back to being together. This way, they learned to live with little wounds that they were caused by the close relationship with their companions, with those quills that are pretty uh, sharp, but the most important part of it was that the heat came from the others, allowed all to survive. Therefore, the best relationship is not the one that brings together perfect people, but the best is when each individual learns to live with the imperfections of others and can admire the other person's good qualities. What is more, it is in the coming together that we can experience an entire level of life, a new level of life. So again, dear friends, please, if you do not have a synagogue to go to, we're open with Hashem's help. You'll be welcomed with a full, with a, with a wonderful embrace at uh, our synagogue. Our phone number is 516-739-3636. And we'll be happy to send you the schedule 
for our synagogue in Mineola for the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah, the Sabbath, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, the whole, the whole high holiday season. You notice that this year, the high holiday seasons has some unique characteristics. And um, some, some interesting things are happening this year, the high holiday season, that seldomly uh, happens. I'd like to point out some of the notable aspects of this new Jewish year about to begin this week, 5785, that stands out. Number one is three-day specials. Rosh Hashanah leads into a Sabbath. It's Thursday, Friday, and Shabbos. As the day that God renews life, the life's force that sustains the world, the two days of Rosh Hashanah are infused with an unparalleled level of holiness. How do we see this? Because the sequence this year is that when Rosh Hashanah falls on Thursday and Friday, followed immediately by Shabbat Shuvah, this supercharges our year. As the Rebbe pointed out, this year we are super, supercharged with holiness because the, high, the first new day, so to speak, post the two days of Rosh Hashanah is right away a Shabbos. Generally, there's a gap between the sanctity of Rosh Hashanah and that of the Shabbos Shuvah. This gap is marked, typically, you end the holiday with Havdalah, recite it at the end of Rosh Hashanah. This year, however, instead of re reacting the, uh, the Havdalah, what are we going to do on Friday night as we conclude the second day? We're not going to make Havdalah, which is done at the end of a holiday. We're going to recite Kiddush. We're going to make a Kiddush, sanctifying the Sabbath that follows and creating one continuous unit of holiness. Thursday, Friday, and Shabbos. Three days of holiness. Another important uh, difference this year, in order typically to prepare for Sabbath, which directly, directly follows a festival, we make what is known as an Eruv Tafshilin. Prior to the festival, that will be this Wednesday, one takes two items, food items, generally challah or matzah, and a cooked dish such as a piece of fish or an unpeeled hard-boiled egg, and we make the Eruv with one another. There are three instances during this high holiday season this year when the festival runs into the Sabbath, and therefore this Eruv Tafshilin is required. What are these three special times? This coming Wednesday, because we have two days of Rosh Hashanah into the Sabbath. We have the Eve of Sukkot, October the 16th, the first two days of Sukkot is a Thursday, Friday, right into a Shabbos. And in the Ashana Rabbah, we also have the last two days of the holiday, which is Shmini Atzeres. And Simchas Torah goes right into the Sabbath, Shabbos Barashas. This allows us, this Erev Tavshilin ceremony, allows us to be able to cook on, on Wednesday. Typically, briefly, on a regular Friday, you can prepare Friday for Shabbos. That's what we do every Friday, prepare food for Shabbos. But since this year, all the Fridays in the high holiday season are on a, sh are, are a holiday, whether it's Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, or, sh uh, or Shemini Atzeres, or Simchas Torah, you don't cook from a, a sh from a holiday to the Shabbos. So what do we do? We actually begin the cooking on the eve of the holiday, which allows us to continue to cook from the eve's food into the first day, and then the second day, and even on the Friday now, we will be able to prepare our food for, um, for, uh, for the Sabbath. So again, we have the opportunity of three times this particular mitzvah. Another important difference this year, Yom Kippur falls on a Shabbat, on a Saturday. The scripture refers to Yom Kippur as Shabbat Shabbaton, the Shabbos of Shabbos. So understandably, when Shabbat and Yom Kippur coincide, it is the ultimate expression of Shabbat. The pleasure of Shabbat is expressed in a most sublime way, not by eating and resting as one does on a regular Shabbos, but by abstaining from physical pleasure and devoting the day completely to the service of God. Wow. And then, another important aspect, we have three sets of three days. As we mentioned, there are three sets of three days, each consisting of two festival days followed immediately by the Shabbat. 
three sets of three days of uninterrupted holiness. The Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson of Righteous Memory, pointed out that the three sets of three creates a double chazaka. In Jewish law, when something occurs three times, it gains a certain weight and becomes established. In our case, these three sets of three create the chazaka of chazaka, adding additional strength to the elevated holiness of this time. My friends, there's so much to think about and so much to prepare for in these last few days to make our Rosh Hashanah great again and to make our Yom Kippur great again and to make our Sukkot and those in between and the concluding days that this year, you know, the concluding days of Sukkot brings us to Shmini Atzeres, Simchus Torah, which will be on the Jewish calendar, the anniversary of October the 7th, where all of us will make an extraordinary effort to be part of the community, to join the community, to become and to celebrate together in this elevated status. You know, the holiday that we are celebrating is known by a number of names. The Torah calls it the day of trumpeting, Yom Teruah, meaning the day on which we blow the shofar. The Talmud calls it the head of the year, Rosh Hashanah, since it's the day that we mark the creation of Adam, the first man, which is when the new year starts according to the Jewish calendar. However, in our prayers, though, it is remembered as the day remembered as Yom Zikaron, Yom Zikaron, Yom the day of remembrance. And in the Kiddush prayer, we recite, that we recite at our, day, at our dinner tables, we conclude with, Blessed are you, Hashem, who sanctified Israel and the day of remembrance. So what exactly is the day of remembrance? Which is a, a name, another term used for Rosh Hashanah. We ask God to remember us. And we know from the Torah that when God remembers someone, this fact brings him blessing and assistance. This is seen in the Rosh Hashanah Torah reading about when we read about the childless matriarch Sarah. What do we read? It says, Vashem pocket Asara. God remembered Sarah. And what happened after God remembered Sarah? The Torah tells us that shortly thereafter she gave birth to a son. In the like manner, we read elsewhere that Rachel, God remembered Rachel. And shortly afterwards, she conceived and bore a child. These examples demonstrate that we very much want God to remember us for the good and then to give us a good and sweet new year. However, we all know that in Judaism, there is a concept of measure for measure. Midah, 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 midah. Therefore, if we want God to remember us, we must in turn remember Him. So how do we remember God? Recently, at a Chabad center somewhere in the United States, a Russian immigrant family remembered the, the, celebrated the bat mitzvah of their daughter. Their family had not marked a bar mitzvah or bar mitzvah in their family for over 100 years, as doing that in Russia was impossible. Before the party began, an American-born Jew approached the Chabad rabbi and asked, I don't understand, how did the Jews from the former Soviet Union succeed in, in maintaining their Jewish identity? It's one thing to be a Jew in America, where a Jewish boy typically gets a bris and goes to the Hebrew school. Then, when he celebrates his uh, bar mitzvah, he, can, he feels like a completed person, a completed Jew. But in Russia, there were no circumcisions, as it was against the law. Doing a bris could send you a few years to Siberia. And who even dreamt of, of a Hebrew school or a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah? How did they succeed in standing strong? What gave them the strength to protect their Jewish identities? And the Chabad rabbi answered him, The first time a Jewish boy in Russia got beaten up in Israel because he was Jewish, and he was called a Zid, despite not being sure whether he really was a Jew in the first place, since his parents hid the fact from him. This, bit, this beating was his bris. The second beating was the Sidda party, the small celebration typically held in kindergarten or first grade, <clears throat> when little Jewish kids received their first prayer book. And the third time was his bar mitzvah. After all, all that, he was confirmed as a complete Jew.
Jew. In Russia, the shliach continued, it was not hard at all to remember that you're Jewish. Over there, the, those in the non-Jewish community would take pains to remind you at every opportunity and every chance. In the United States, however, we are liable to forget, quickly forget our true identity, who we are, where we're from, and where we're headed. In America, we must seek means to ensure that the fact that we're all Jews is remembered well, and above all, that our children remember it well. So on Rosh Hashanah, there is an ancient custom of resolving to keep a new mitzvah in the coming year, the one that we did not observe until now. So, dear friends, today, as we speak to you on the last Sunday of this year, let us resolve to take on a mitzvah, any mitzvah, that will remind our children every day of their Jewish identities. Let us recite, for example, the sacred verse, of Shema Yisroel Adenoi Eloheinu Adenoi Echad. Why don't we perhaps take on this mitzvah of every night before we go to sleep with our children to say the Shema? Or perhaps when we wake up in the morning, why don't we all get up and say together, Maida'ani, in the morning thanking Hashem for being awake, to be alive, and to have our soul. Alternatively, let us make sure that our children give a few pennies to charity every day. Whatever it is, we each can come up with a creative, original idea to remind our children. But I also add, a, maybe we should and remind ourselves. Maybe we, those nice pair of tefillin that somebody donated to you and gave to you, it's time to pull them out and say, you know what? I'm going to do it on Sundays. Maybe I'll do it on Mondays and Thursdays. Whatever. Ta let's take upon a new mitzvah that we may not have been doing it up until now, um, whether as whether, uh, a mezuzah on the door or anything else, as long as it's done every day, it doesn't matter what it is. And then, as we strive to remember God every day, or at least not to forget Him, as we pray on Rosh Hashanah, what do we say? Happy is the man who doesn't forget you. Then God, who is described in the Zohar as the person's mirror, will remember us for goodness and for blessing and to grant us good and a sweet year. So basically, my friends, if we want God to remember us by us remembering Him, it makes the difference. And that's why it's called Yom Zikaron, the day of remembrance. The most famous of all Rosh Hashanah customs is dipping apples in honey. For some, this custom is the only thing they do to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. They dip the apples in honey and they say, may it be your will that this new year be good and sweet for us. But this is not the only custom. This isn't even the only extra food that we eat on Rosh, or celebrate Rosh Hashanah. We eat pomegranates because they have so many seeds. And we pray that may it be your will that our merits be numerous like the seeds of the pomegranate. We eat carrots and pray that our merits be numerous because the Yiddish word merin means carrots. But it also means numerous. In fact, in the Sephardi community, they eat at least 17 different foods and have a prayer for each of them. There's, a, there's another food that we eat that I don't like that much. It's called the fish head. Um, it's always disconcerting to have the tiny little eyeballs staring up at you while you're eating flesh off the torso. It can really ruin your appetite for the rest of the meal. That's why this custom uh, in particular, always catches my attention. When we eat the fish head, we say, may it be your will that I be a head and not a tail. In other words, let me be a leader and not a schlepper. What kind of prayer is this? Imagine if everyone was a leader and everyone was giving his own instructions. Imagine if everybody here in the synagogue uh, was a rabbi. Oy vey. We have enough trouble putting up with one rabbi. If everyone were rabbis, it would simply be a disaster. There's a well-known joke that it's impossible to be a prime minister in Israel because every Israeli is a prime minister. And on Rosh Hashanah, we pray for this, that we should all be leaders. So Rabbi Shur ben Levi once accompanied Elijah, the prophet, to a city where, he, where they weren't welcomed respectfully. Nobody offered them food or drink or place to stay. On his way out, Elijah blessed them, may you all become leaders. 
When they arrived the next day, they were greet, greeted very warmly, and after a nice stay, Elijah blessed them too. May there only be one leader amongst you. So Rabbi Yeshua became confused, and he asked Elijah why he wished all the greedy men would become leaders, while the warm, generous people of the second town were only would have one. We know the answer, of course. Too many leaders are a recipe for disaster. Why then do we pray for all of us to be leaders? Well, time doesn't allow us to go into great details, but the important thing is we all can be leaders. We can always make a difference. We don't have to be all the rabbis, we don't have to be all this or that the other. When I, when I say, may I be a, lead, uh, be a head, we don't mean we all want to be leaders. We mean that we should be able to feel another, another's pain as though it was our own. Today on Rosh Hashanah, coming up this week, we try to be more leader-like in this respect to feel the caring for others. And still, this is not the hard part. The real challenge of being a leader is learning to feel the joy of another as though it is were your own joy. When you come to shul, you hear about other people's joys. It makes you look forward to having joys. A person stays at home sadly, never participates in anybody else's joys. It's all themselves. So when you meet a friend on the street and he tells you, I just closed a, a huge deal, it should make us happy, as if it was our own son or daughter who closed the deal. Instead of saying, good for you, as everybody else does, wow, you should say, you just made my day. That's the importance of being a, a leader in caring for others. The Rebbe always asked people to inform him of good news, and these good tidings actually gave the Rebbe energy. They added to his faith, his, his uh, health, I should say. So the importance of being a leader, leader in caring for each other is such an important thing, and that's what we have in mind. Um, that uh, when we eat the head of a fish, uh, to be to be to be someone who has their head, their mind, their attitude, their outlook, caring for others. Whenever we go around that way, it's a whole different world. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl, reminding everyone: make Rosh Hashanah great. Do whatever we can to participate in the synagogue, participate in the holidays and all the customs and all the good things. If anybody needs more information for the holidays, 516-739-3636. Or you can drop me an email, Rabbi Pearl, one word, at ChabadMiniola.com. Wishing everybody a wonderful, wonderful, sweet, good new year. Thank you all. Speak to you next year.